the word to intimidate people and have them feel that something was truer because mm -hmm. it was in writing. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, um, that wasn't always the case because at the time we're talking that he's writing and doing his work. You know how many people are reading? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not many. Mm -hmm. And that took a long time until the, the Gutenberg Galaxy where you had uh, many, many more books um, available of uh, the Gutenberg Bible that it was made, it, the printing was such that uh, there could be, uh, you know, books, mm -hmm. and uh, it, primarily it was the Bible, available to people on a large scale, yeah. media people, okay? Writing is very important. I'm not going to tell you it yeah. isn't. Books are very important. They're also very limited. You see? That that is only one way of, if, if um, I write something, then um, I shouldn't be relying just on a literate uh, or literal, literal interpretation of what it is I'm saying. Mm -hmm. If I do that, that's very closed. When we, you, write poetry, mm -hmm. when we um, compose music, okay, when we drum, all the things that we do, it allows for much more than a literal interpretation so that we're able to get to a deeper level of reality. And all I'm saying is that we should not, um, we should not close out these other modes mm -hmm. of expression, um, of, of communication, that they're very important. What we're doing now is very important. It can't, we cannot rely merely on the written word, okay? Mm -hmm. And I think that there is a tendency for us not to understand that, for us to, um, to not understand the power that is in other modalities of ways in which we uh, express ourselves. And even in the way that we use the written word, because our people did that. We used writing, but we used it in a more symbolic way. Okay. Okay. What is the Europeanization of human consciousness? It is the acceptance of what I'm calling the objectification of the universe, mm -hmm. the materialization of the universe, so that again, um, spirit is denied, spirit is uh, mistrusted, um, it is relegated to an inferior uh, uh, position. And what happens is then we um, think in ways that facilitate our oppression. We think in ways that deny our spiritual power. That's what I call the Europe pianization of, of our consciousness and that has been talked about by other authors um, Asante talks about that mm -hmm. um, um, but it is a consciousness which reflects the European mm -hmm. someone sitting home might say well you know what's what's the harm in listening to a little Bach a little Beethoven um, getting into some Mil Milton, almost said Mil mm -hmm. <laughs> Mil Milton. What's the, what's the harm? Um, the harm is that if you are a people who have uh, been so conditioned as we have, mm -hmm. that we have to even sit here and discuss, convince each other of what are our strengths um, what did we lose what did we have who are we in a positive sense that your focus tends to become that little bit of Bach and that little bit of Milton and a and little bit of this so forth and so on when you have not indeed understood 
the African worldview, African philosophy, African conceptions of truth, what African ritual is all about, um, ancient African history, um, African culture, that you have not, that needs to be your frame of reference. Then, when you get that little bit of Bach, you have a context within which to place it. What happens with us is the reverse. We have terms, and this comes out of the European uh, Asili, the European concept of truth, like classical, okay? Classical is supposed to mean the highest form in any particular culture, right? It's what you value most. That's one meaning for classical. It also can be a reference point, a pinnacle, a high point. So we are raised to think that Bach, Beethoven, whoever, that represents classical music in a universal sense. That becomes our reference point. We're saying, well, that's the best. Everything else, and now we know we don't enjoy it the most. You know what I mean? <laughs> we know that. But we feel a little bit, uh, well, that helps to make us not quite, we haven't reached yet. You know what I mean? Whatever that point is we're supposed to reach, we haven't gotten there yet because we still enjoy all this other music. we got to be refined a little bit more. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's the danger. The danger is what we know of the culture of our uh, 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 oppressors and the place that it has in our value system that is the superficial value system which is a product of colonialism it's being colonized that's the danger the danger is that we right now the 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 the, the position that we're in the condition that we're in we need to be putting all of our energies into understanding who we are because by understanding that that's what gives you the 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 posture to be able to look critically at what has been imposed on us we don't have a place to look critically at it because we are assuming the superiority of it that's why i thought this study was important because all you have to do is get outside of it, study the African worldview, and then you can be in a position to deny that reality. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you this question to, to, to finish up with Plato. You would say that Plato uh, played a great role in creating what we today call the European? Yes. And for what reason now? Yes. Um, what I see is that um, in the development of um, European culture, which is an ongoing process, um, in the fulfillment of the Asili, that there are certain seminal points, seminal thinkers, doers, um, who at whatever point in history they were at, um, served a, 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 a role of... Um, of solidifying and further developing the definition of what it means to be European. Now, be let's look at before Plato. What you have are a lot of European groups. You know, we can look at the Indo-Europeans, who have already, the Asili Sea, I think, is in place, okay? How does it manifest itself? It manifests itself in aggression. Aggression. A silly meaning. This cultural seed uh -huh. that for the Europeans is defined in terms of the need for power in order to um, um, uh, uh, achieve fulfillment. Okay. I believe that's unlike any other cultural theory. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so you see aggression. You already see the individualism. It would be good to look at Diaz's work, for instance, in terms of looking at the features of what he calls the, you know, the Indo-European or the Northern Cradle. Okay, mm -hmm. so you, you already see these things. However, it cannot become the, the world dominant power that it needs to be because you, they're not uh, unified. 
Okay, so what do you need? You need something to begin to say to these people, you are one. You um, can gain more power by coming together. Because when you've got this strong destructive tendency, which is something that I talk about, you know, in the book, mm -hmm. you see, there's an innate destructive tendency. You've got this individualism because we've already talked about the separation of, of, of the human being, right? Mm -hmm. You've got this aggressive tendency. Then if you, something doesn't bring you together, what will you do? You destroy each other, okay? Plato comes along and he uses the concept of truth, what, what would be called an epistemology. That's only a concept of truth. Uses that... Um, as something around which people can come together and identify and say, okay, this is going to be us. Now, as I said, that didn't happen right away. He had to fight all these other people that would be dissonant, you know, voices. But eventually, yes, that became what Europeans identified with. They said this way of thinking, this rationalism, this extreme rationalism that helps us to control, it gives us the illusion that we are controlling the future, the past, the universe, and everything. Mm -hmm. This is us as European people. So he was key at that point. Now, then you get a little later stage. Here comes along. Let's look at 312. Um, what they call A.D. Um, here comes Constantine. What does he do? He sees that what you need is a religious statement which will uh, help to achieve this world domination, mm -hmm. this power. Help to bring these Europeans together so that they can have power over others. So he adopts Christianity, you see, mm -hmm. and that gives him the model that he needs in order to say, we have the right, in fact, we have the mandate. And he said he personally had the mandate, and you need to look at his own quotes and the things that were written about him, to go throughout the world and in the name of this one true God which was them, which was the Europeans, um, to make everybody into uh, these Christians. So he's adopting Christianity as a weapon of control. Absolutely. And as to, to uh, it, it's compatible with the Roman Empire. The, on a political level, you've got this empire which is spreading and spreading and spreading, right? He wants control of that. He looks at this religion and he says, ha, ah, that'll do it. That will help me. What I'll do is say, look, there's only one God. Christianity comes along. There are all these other religions in the world. Christianity comes along and says, all of the other religions are false. All of them are bad. This is the one true one. Well, that fits. Then he says, I've been placed here to uh, service this one true God. They put me here for this. I've got to conquer people so that they can, you know, be correct religiously. I hate to do it, but... <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> All right. But I have to. <laughs> Go ahead. What you gonna do? No, go ahead. No, I'm just saying. That's All right. what he's saying. <laughs> so that's what he's saying. Um, you know, he, he had this vision, this dream with this cross, and the cross said, conquer by this. Now, this is all in his own words and in his friend's, Eusebius's words, right? And he takes this cross, made everybody make these crosses, and said, conquer by this, and they went into battle. They won, and that was it. He said, yeah, this is the thing. And I'm saying that at that point in the development of uh, uh, European culture, that was key. That became this solidifying, uh, uh, defining form, uh, institution that would help to bring together. Uh, the monolithic. Yes. Uh -huh. what, was, what was Europe? What was it going to be? All fulfilling the Asili. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Then at another stage, um, you get this definition of science doing that. Again, based on this, this concept of the object, uh -huh. that um, we are the scientists, this is the age of science, um, uh, we are in the forefront of that, 
uh, and therefore we have the right to rule the world, really, because we are the scientists. We are the smartest people, most knowledgeable people. Um, the uh, capitalism at, at, at one point becomes uh, that which brings together uh, the European self-image um, and has them working as one, helping to further develop the Asili. So at different stages in European development, um, there, there is a need, there's, there's this, this tendency to, to be fighting each other, you mm -hmm. see, um, um, and then of course you have all the other people in the world who are also uh, developing and responding to this, so you need ways of, of controlling them and ways of, of making sure your troops are tight mm -hmm. and together. So you need something to rally around. I want to ask you about Greek myth and, and how Greek myth help explain um, European violence. Oh, um, well, I think it, 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 it uh, probably helps more to um, not so much explain it, but as to, to, to demonstrate mm -hmm. it and the need for violence, which I think is part of the Asili. Mm -hmm. um, there is um, well. Let's not even look at. Let, let's not look at that uh, myth. Let's look at. Um, let's go prior to that and look at uh, Indo-European um, mythology. When you uh, talk about Odin mm -hmm. uh, and these various gods, who were the war gods, who had to be fed uh, by human blood. Um, who rewarded people with um, uh, uh, this heaven, uh, you know, Valhalla, yeah, the hall, yeah. um, which was the warrior heaven, which was this great honor if you got to go there. Um, and the emphasis was on uh, individual, uh, individuals in battle, and, uh, you know, the bloodier the battle, the, the better it was, because it, it made you a, a, a better person and, and so forth. Um, early Indo-European mythology um, is, is replete with or filled with um, these kinds of, of images and, and, uh, and concepts. Um, within the Greek culture, we get the same thing, where um, violence is um, it's valued. Um, it's sought after. There is some kind of fulfillment that comes out of it. Now, in terms of my uh, analysis, um, it is that the Asili, again, you must understand, is incomplete. So that it's not in harmony with the universe. And I think the concept of harmony is a very important one for us as a spiritual people. Um, and so it, it is like almost uh, what uh, Colby Cambone says, um, uh, formerly uh, uh, Joe Baldwin. He says that, that they come to be, the European, as being outside of, of nature, outside of that natural uh, uh, universe, which is a state of harmony. And therefore, there's this constant thrust to try to... Um, uh, 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 subdue nature or to see that as an enemy so that the emphasis is on confrontation, it's on destruction um, and you see it within Greek culture uh, you know as well mm -hmm. um, so that the Yassili, um, um has to it, it forces the, 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 the collective the group uh, 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 behavior to be destructive now that can bring us to even their concept of progress. We as African people accept this idea of progress, thinking that uh, we've got to imitate uh, Europeans, that um, you know uh, everything that is technologically more efficient is better. The higher uh, you can build buildings, the better it is. The more cement that you have, you know, the bigger the cities and so forth and so on. We don't really look at where their idea of progress comes from. It comes from their worldview. And it is really about um, controlling nature, 
it is about and, and, and the feelings of power that come from that for them. So we don't get feelings of power by controlling nature. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's the difference. Um, it is about consuming the universe. Consumption. So that now you get them talking about the problem of uh, what, ecological sanity, they call it. Mm -hmm. That's a very deep issue. But they are not prepared to deal with it because the culture doesn't have the, the wherewithal to deal with it. You can't deal with uh, the concept of uh, interrelationship of all of us as natural beings in the universe and the balance and harmony when you're talking about things being objects. Mm -hmm. You can't do that because the way you think doesn't allow you to do mm -hmm. it. What problem does that present for African people? Um, you talked about how Plato influenced um, European thinking. But here you have uh, Africans, um, in African Americans in mm -hmm, this case, mm -hmm. in a culture where, as you indicated earlier, we are forced in many cases to ape, mm -hmm. ape European. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, how does how does this need to split mm -hmm. the emotional mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the uh, rational, mm -hmm. all right, to be like Plato. Right. How does that impact on us? Okay. What it does is that um, if we were, we talk about having independent schools, which I think is what we need to be doing. We need to be having our own schools because, of course, you've got to educate your own children. Mm -hmm. um, but in doing that, we need to be looking at what are the concepts that you're going to use as you develop your children? How are you going to make sure that they are being developed as African children? How are you going to guarantee that it is a spiritual conception of the universe that they learn to use so that they can be, that their energies can be, can be liberated, can be released. What is happening is that we are using these same concepts that you've just referred to in dealing with our own children. What does that do to them? You know how we talk all the time about uh, the problem of our children being turned off in school? You have teachers talking about, I can't reach them. We talk about, um, oh, this child is hyperactive, um, and so you want to give them drugs so that you can, you know, uh, control them. Mm -hmm. um, what we're doing is trying to relate to our children using our, uh, using alien concepts of not only truth, not only learning, but of the human being. So that the spiritual needs of our children are not being met in those school arenas. Because we've made the mistake of thinking that, see what a, the academy means is that you separate out whatever is intellectual from everything else. So that in the European conception, an academy is, is a place where intellectual things go on and there's no place for anything else. That's not a realistic uh, conception of a human being. A human being is a whole human being. So when you have a child in a school and in a classroom, they are not just this mind that you, that you want to control. Pump stuff in. That you <laughs> yeah. pump stuff in and you're ignoring the rest of them and so forth. So that we have to find, for instance, I'm going to take something which will seem very simple to you, uh -huh. um, probably unimportant. That would be good. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's, but to uh -huh. me it's central. Mm -hmm. And it's a good example. If we, we are going to have to look at how do we build buildings. How do we build buildings in such a way that we help ourselves to, to communicate with each other and with our spirits? Mm -hmm. 
And how will that help us to think? How are we going to arrange classroom? We take for granted that you have to arrange a classroom so that you have these lines of seats. You know, and then we ask the children to stick. They come in there. You know, we talk about five, six, seven-year-olds, and they have to sit. And they have to sit absolutely still all the time. There's, there's no other way that they do things. Suppose when we come together, we form circles. You see? Mm -hmm. Would that make a difference? That's what we have to begin to look at is we have to question everything 